Uh, Lucy Hawking joins us now for your first television interview since his death. So yes, that's we're, right. we're very grateful that you're with mm. us. And well, you're here you because it's a very important week, isn't it? Is. it? It is. We're in the lead up to the service of Thanksgiving at Westminster Abbey, which is for the life and work of my father. And we hope it will be a way to celebrate his extraordinary achievements in life and that the service will reflect the diversity of his appeal. How do you think he would have liked to be remembered? He always said that your legacy um, was in your children and the work you left behind. Mm. And so I think it's very, very important that we take the elements of the work he did, which lies in his work in cosmology and physics, but also in his outreach, in his work in education, his advocacy for the NHS and for disability mm. rights, and we carry that on. I, I mean, I had the great honour of doing one of his last big t television interviews uh, a few months before he died. I went up to Cambridge. Mm. It was one of the best days of my life, I've got to say. Mm. Just spending time with your dad was such an extraordinary experience. But there was a clip I wanted to play you. And it was, if I, it, I said to him, look, if you know the world was about to end, how would you like to spend your last day on Earth? And this is what he said. If the world was to end tomorrow, what's the last thing you would want to do? Being with my family and listening to Wagner while sipping champagne in the summer sun. I mean, so simple, so beautiful. His and it, family, and it, it, champagne and a dash of Wagner. <laughs> um, and it made me laugh because when I was a child, my father used to listen to Wagner at top volume and I would sit on the stairs with my fingers in my ears. <laughs> so I thought of that on this desert island. He'll be there playing where and I'll still have my, my fingers <laughs> in my ears. He obviously lived a lot longer than many people assumed that he would live, given his condition. What was it like for you as his family to, I guess, live with the constant worry that he may not make another day? Um, we were enormously lucky to have so much time with him, so much more time than anybody could have possibly thought. Um, he had extraordinary length, longevity with his condition, and in many ways he was a medical miracle as well as a scientific one. Um, but it was difficult because we did think that he could pass away at any time mm. or he would last forever. Mm. And so actually, even though with somebody who's been ill for a very long time, you wouldn't think that their death could shock you, but it did. He was a, a rare combination of a genius, but also a very funny man. Mm. I mean, he just loved jokes. He loved having fun. And saying, he was very, saying, very, saying very, provocative very... things to get ah, people yes. going. Yeah, he, I mean, his sense of humour we were just talking about when he was a child continued all his life. Well, well when he was a little boy, he threw stink bombs. And then when he got older, he threw metaphorical stink he did. bombs. <laughs> <laughs> but when I interviewed him and I asked him, uh, uh, you know, various supplementary questions. And obviously it would take him a long time to mm. answer, but it was the way he would slightly smirk before unleashing a thunderbolt oh, about I Donald know that Trump smile. or whatever. I know and that smile everybody well. knew what was coming. You the know. smile and the twinkle. Yeah. And then the one-line devastating comment yeah. um, was, was really his trademark mm. in the way he was able to sum things up and he was able to give us these insights that were so clear. Mm. Um, whether it was in his work in science or his commentary. From someone, my dad only lived with motor neurone disease for four years, your dad obviously a lot longer, but he was really sort of seen as someone, as a beacon of hope in a sense, because we're hoping that that could mean that there are ways that there might be a cure, there might be better treatments in the future. And I know you've done a lot of work on that, that you've done a lot of support for the Motor Neuro and Disease Association. I think that's fantastic. Um, I heard something you said the other day about how your father bore his suffering with dignity. And I was really touched by that because my father was the same. He bore his challenges with enormous dignity and he didn't let them define him. He did what he excelled in his career, but he also went out there as a disabled person. He wanted to go to restaurants, to hotels. He flew on budget airlines. He had a family. He just wouldn't let it stop him. He used to like to say, there should be no boundaries to human endeavour. And there really were none. He, he was a remarkable uh, guy. His office was quite extraordinary. Never been in anything quite like it. But I think it should be preserved in its entirety in the detail of where objects was, were placed. And perhaps it could be used in a narrative sense of this is the room, this is where he worked, but also as a teaching tool mm. that maybe we could make it interactive. He had a blackboard outside a chalkboard where yeah. students would just rock up and put but, you know, stuff from formula. Yeah. And when we were children, we used to write on it too, just in case. Oh, just in case we came up with a brilliant formula. Brilliant. And did you? Well, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we did. Still to be discovered. Yeah. It's, it's lovely to see you.